Let me bring in some additional voices here on what's going on. With me now, Seth Kaplan, managing partner of Airline Weekly, CNN aviation analyst Mary Schiavo, and Fred TC, a licensed commercial pilot. So, um, Seth, let me just begin with you here, and let's just talk a little bit about the history of Egypt Air, because you're unique in the fact that, from what I understand, you, you train some e Egypt Air employees, or you, you taught a number of courses, you know about the planes. Tell me about Egypt Air. Yeah, I know the airline quite well. Uh, to be clear, Brooke, I'm, I'm more on the commercial side, but in those courses were people like pilots, uh, I know a few of them, uh, who, who were there to learn more about aviation management. Uh, so yeah, I've been to the training center there. And uh, you know, within their region, they're very well regarded. Uh, this is an airline that on one hand, you know, looks up to some others around the world. Lufthansa was sort of uh, very involved in bringing them into the the Western world, so to speak. Uh, they're in the alliance with Lufthansa, with United Airlines, a member of the Star Alliance. Uh, but within the Middle East, they're an airline that helps train others. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, certainly being on the ground there, you know, you get every impression that uh, that this is that this is a professional airline. You're meeting the pilots. These are people you would feel uh, very comfortable flying on an airplane uh, commanded by them. All right, so that's on the airline. Uh, Mary Schiavo, with you in your investigative hat, sort of, you know, I'm wondering, as we've talked a bit about, you know, concerns over some personnel, uh, specifically at Charles de Gaulle, and we know that, that thousands of lockers, uh, you know, had been had been looked into, I believe, also at the other airport at Orly as well, and, and a number of people were let go from their jobs because of security concerns. That said, uh, who would have had access if we go with this potential bomb theory as this plane was was, uh, you know, getting scrubbed uh, before taking off for Cairo? Who would have access to that plane other than, you know, the, the pilots, the crew? Well, and, and anyone working at the airport. Now, everybody's talking about the enhanced security measures, and there are a lot of different ones. I think it's important to go back and talk about where they came from. Because remember, back in July of 2014, enhanced security measures were put in place for planes bound for the U.S. at the U.S. demand out of Paris because the U.S. intelligence had indicated that AQAP, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, had developed explosives that were very difficult to detect going through security. Mm -hmm. So the enhanced measures where you check the plane, you know, the bathrooms, the, the cargo holds, you know, literally seal off all the, uh, the uh, various uh, uh, bins and cupboards, et cetera, on the plane, those don't apply to all planes across the board. And so here, with this plane originating outside of Paris and outside of Europe, it would have received its overnight check. They would have checked, you know, the bins, the, the, the trash bins, the, the carts on the plane, etc. But then once the plane is making its routes during the day, it would have gotten a walk around. But anyone loading the plane at the various airports, anyone performing catering or cleaning, um, there, there are literally hundreds of persons that would have touched that plane during the day. So, you know, and, and a plane is, you know, basically a ticking time bomb. Anything put on that plane that's not been taken off flies with it to the various airports. So some of the enhanced security, starting in 2014, was specifically aimed at planes for the U.S. This plane not, might not have gotten the enhanced security. And, and Brooke, by the way, you, know, you mentioned yeah. a, a few moments ago, Egypt Air Flight 990, obviously one of the the worst mm -hmm. incidents in the history of that airline, although not yeah. not the only difficult incident. My mind goes to uh, uh, an incident that I think everybody remembers about a decade before that, 1988 Pan Am Flight 103, of course. Don't forget, uh, that was one where, yeah, although the plane took off from London Heathrow, uh, the bomb, by all appearances, had been placed aboard in Malta. Uh, the aircraft made a stop in Frankfurt before going to Heathrow, and then uh, and obviously we all know what happened over Lockerbie, Scotland. So there is precedent for that. And, and really, when you think of, uh, well, you know, developed world airports, if you will, a bomb going off aboard an aircraft, uh, leaving one of them, if that, in fact, that's what happened here. This would be the first major incident of that since then, a plane leaving a place like Paris. In that case, it, it had left London, of course. No, I'm glad you bring that up. I had asked Mary last hour because it's also important to point out 24 hours prior, you know, this plane was both in, it was in Africa, it was in Eritrea, and it was also in Tunisia. Uh, yeah. And, you know, as others have pointed out as well, it only takes a couple of ounces of some sort of explosive to ha have some sort of catastrophic, you know, destruction in its wake. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and ICAO, by the way, the, uh, the agency of the United Nations had put Eritrea last year on, on sort of a, a red flag list of countries along with some others where, where they where they had some concerns. On and, the and I have to mention... Oh, go ahead, Mary. Go ahead. And then we'll well, I have I to mention one other thing. 
strange coincidence. Now, right now, remember the shoe bomber. The shoe yeah. bomber was coming out of Paris, headed to Miami. Uh, Paris authorities questioned him. He didn't make his flight that day. He was allowed to rebook for the next day. But the shoe bomber had an accomplice. People don't talk about the accomplice. He was from Tunisia. Shoe bombers in Supermax in the United States. The Tunisian co-conspirator uh, went to, to prison for 13 years as an out. So we've got the Tunisian Paris connection in other, not saying this is anything like that, but in other sure. attacks or attempted attacks in the past, we had these two locations also implicated. By the way, the shoe bomber traveled from Brussels to board the plane. Hmm. Um, Fred, to you, just in terms of the timing, do you find any of it curious or it could be a total coincidence that this is right around when this plane is leaving Greek airspace, entering, you know, Egyptian airspace, when it just goes off the radar? Well, a, a few things jump out at me. You know, a lot of people say that you want to, to put a bomb to go off just as the aircraft's getting the cruising altitude because it's got the most amount of fuel. But a lot of times terrorism and terrorists want to make a different statement. And they may have wanted to make a statement that they wanted this airplane to explode as it got closer to Egypt. So it, it's, it's very, very difficult to tell, you know, the timing of matters. And these things, for all the sophistication, they aren't as accurate as everyone likes to think they are on, on a lot of occasions. You know, and, and I think, you know, clearly I think the bomb was, if there was a bomb, was in the back of the airplane. I mean, that would account for kind of the, the vicious rolls, which you cannot do with an Airbus. You know, if you're the pilot in an Airbus. Let me, let me stop you there. You People haven't heard this. Let me, let me sure. stop you on that point. So we know at some point that this plane apparently, you know, sort of jerked left 90 degrees, jerked right about 360 degrees, and ultimately was gone. And so those kind of maneuvers, you're saying, that leads you to, to, to perhaps hypothesize that, 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 that a bomb could be in the Correct. back because why? Well, it's a sophisticated guess, all right? We, we don't know. And, and look, we know where the wreckage is. They'll find the black boxes. They'll find the wreckage. They'll find the pieces that will answer all those questions. But in an Airbus, the Airbus has certain modes. It's what they call a fly-by-wire airplane. In the old airplanes and a lot of the airplanes that I fly, when you pull on the stick or you turn it, cables, pulleys, electronics, move the devices. In the Airbus, when, you, when the pilot moves that joystick to his left, all that does is send a signal to the computer to tell the airplane what to do. And if, you, if you're a pilot in an Airbus and if you're at cruise, at cruise altitude and cruise speeds, and you throw that stick hard to the left, the airplane will not go hard to the left. It will only turn as quickly as it thinks is safely possible. And again, if you go back to the right. So these maneuvers, if we know if they are correct, remember this radar facility was 400 miles from this airplane. So until we find the, F, the flight data recorder, we're not really going to know what the airplane did, but if these are accurate, then they are not consistent with the, with the way an Airbus can be flown at cruise. Okay, let's hope for the family's sakes they find that, as we know, some of the wreckage, perhaps not all, but the pieces, the tail, where you have all that information uh, lying in that, uh, in those data recorders. Uh, hopefully they, they find that soon. Um, Mary and Fred and Seth, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. Thanks Special live coverage. Thank you. Could